All right. I am so excited for this episode of the Spone Train Subconscious Programming Podcast. You all know that I teach many ways to use language to shift our focus, to make meaning, to use our body language, to change our emotions. But oftentimes there's things going on underneath. There's undercurrents of our biology, of our gender, of our, our life, where we are in our life cycle that affect these things very strongly. And, and often that doesn't get covered or gets brushed over. So today we're going to go over some of that, specifically the differences between the male brain and the female brain. And this stuff is essential to understand. So my guest today is the pioneering author of the New York Times bestselling books, The Female Brain, The Male Brain, and more recently, The Upgrade, How the Female Brain Gets Stronger and Better in Midlife and Beyond. She is the Lynn and Mark Benioff Endowed Chair in Clinical Psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, and the founder of the UCSF's Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic. I am joined by none other than Dr. Luann Brizendine. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Nicholas, for having me. I'm really uh, excited to talk with your audience and just like answer all of their questions. <laughs> so first of all, we just kind of had this discussion, but I want to point out to everybody because I noticed this right away is on the female brain, you have these telephone cords, right? And on the male brain, you have duct tape. And so you've kind of shaped them into the, the shape of a brain with these and we'll get into why that's important and significant in just a moment. But first of all, I want to know what got you into this work. Oh, so, you know, I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley in the days when all of the professors were like, all the researchers were just discovering all kinds of effects that hormones were causing behaviors, particularly they were looking at um, testosterone in animals and how it caused sexual behavior and what caused sexual behavior in males and females. And that was all kind of brand new because, you know, the, the purpose of a hormone is to cause a behavior. Like, you know, when you have, when you have um, the hunger hormones come on you, well, that causes you to eat. Duh, right? Yes. And then when you have you have the sex hormones come on you, that makes you want to search out and have sex. So it's really robust. And I just, you know, when you're 20 years old and something, they're telling you something, oh, we know what causes you to want to have sex, whatever. It definitely got my attention and a lot of other people's. <laughs> I really got into it at that time and became obsessed with the, with the hormone effects on the brain that cause behaviors. I love it. And that's, yeah, that's right, right up my alley as well, because we act emotionally and we justify with logic. Right. And so most people have a lot of these subconscious triggers that are programmed in that kick these hormones and, and these emotions into play. And then they, they take an action. Well, a lot of times it's biological, right? Like these are deep drivers that are millions of years, thousands of years of evolution that kick into play, right? So Nicholas, my, my phrase about this is biology is destiny unless you know what it's doing to you. I love it. Know thyself, right? Know thyself and, and don't blame yourself, but to know that you have the steering wheel in your own brain and you can choose because we have free will to act in a civilized fashion or not, whatever that means to you, you have the steering wheel. And when you put your hands on your own steering wheel in your brain, you can definitely turn it in one direction or another, no matter how your biology or hormones are driving you. However, some people feel so guilty because of the feelings they're having that their hormones are driving their brain to think that they feel they're a bad boy or, you know, that, that, that kind of talk is, is, is sort of useless because it's not, it's, it's, it's everybody, dude. It's not just you. <laughs> right. It's a, a lot of judgment, right? And, and as humans, we have this like thick outer layer on our brain, which can separate us from those impulses. We can watch those impulses come up and, and make a decision and not be the victim of our programming probably more than any other animal in the animal kingdom, right? And not be the victim of your biology. I love it. So we'll talk, we'll talk specifically about what that means and, and how to implement it. So I love how you you know, you set these books up. You kind of took us through the life cycle of a male brain and a female brain and, and when it starts out in the womb and as it ages. And, and let's talk about, I guess, you know, when that impregnated, uh, little baby in there starts to, to change direction yeah. and decide which gender, let's which, just, what, let's what's just happening? Get, let's just get down to the really beginning. Okay. Let's go down to the beginning. So remember when that, so the egg is sitting there waiting for the sperm, the sperm that the sperm that enters the egg, if it's carrying an X chromosome, that means XX is going to happen. That'll be female. And if it's carrying a Y, 
it'll be XY, and that means male. So what that what happens is about six to eight weeks of fetal development in the male, the tiny testicles start pumping out huge amounts of testosterone, almost like at male levels. It marinates the body and brain and turns it male. And the other side, the XX, the female develops all of those at that time unperturbed by testosterone. Mm -hmm. So that default is female. And females still have testosterone and males, you know, still have the oh, estrogen. Yeah, we, have, but... we have each other. Yeah, the, the females always have like one that we have a little bit. But this is the, this is what's called this. This is what we call the developmental organizational effects of a hormone that actually causes the development to happen in that direction. So the, the, the what, what that testosterone is doing in the male is it's causing the it's causing the prostate and the testes and all the ducts and everything in the male to develop. We, we see where we, that little fetus can go either way. It can go male or female. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the testosterone then kills off all the stuff that would be the ovaries and uterus and vagina. So, and in the female, basically the uh, vagina and, and uterus just go ahead and develop because they don't have the testosterone poisoning them to not develop. So it's just, it's, it's all kind of the levers of how this works in a really cool way while you're still a fetus before you even pop out. And by the time we pop out, we're basically typically either male or female body and brain. That's how it goes. Perfect. Okay. So, so now we kind of know how, how we started out and, and the journey we're going on. And then let's work up through, I guess, through the toddler years and see what's the difference in behavior in in physiology and, and how does that shape? So the cool thing that happens, of course, is that, okay, so, so the, so the boy comes out, he's, he's, his body is wired for, you know, for, 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 for maleness and the females coming out and she's wired for femaleness. And, and what that means is it's, it's a propensity and what, what kinds of things little girls tend, tend to spend a lot more time, like gazing at faces. Whereas in little boys, you can distract and they can look at the airplane you've got zooming around here. Or they, they, they tend to, to be, um, more interested in things that move to kind of from the get go, you know, by, by, and that is then when the play, the three and four year olds are doing play dates, um, this wonderful scientist named Eleanor Maccabee, Maccabee, who is now deceased, but she did all these really basic work at Stanford for many years looking and the details of how boys and girls typically play. Mm -hmm. Girl, little girls will sit and they will play with a doll or with something, or they, they will play with something and do what's called relationship play. They'll assign you a role. They'll say to you, they'll say, okay, okay, Nicholas, you're going to be the daddy and I'm going to be the mommy and da, 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 da. Or you be the doctor and I'll be the patient. You know, they do that. And little boys will sit and do that with little girls for about a few minutes. And then boom, they're off and running and they're going, come on guys, let's go get them. You know, they're, they're wanting to fight off the enemy and, you know, grab the swords. And they really, they, they want action, action. It's, it's really called, in boys, it's a technical term that's actually used by psychologists. It's called rough and tumble play. Rough and tumble play is done at least six times more by boys than girls. It's not the girls. I mean, I was, I was kind of a little bit of a tomboyish girl. I love to run around and go, go hunt for lizards and snakes in the, in the ditch. And I, I like to do some of that stuff, but I also had my dolls. So it, it's not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not meaning that things are completely just bimodal. We, we have sure. lots of mixtures. Okay. So I want to, you know, there's the idea that, you know, and the male brain and the female brain, remember, are they're more alike than different. After all, we're the same species. So let's get that set. And then there's lots of variations on the theme that, that happen, you know, in the what happens for trans people and, and same sex attract. There's a whole lot of things. And we can also talk about the theories. There's not, unfortunately, yet enough research in that area. But that will that will come. Stay tuned in the next few years. Hopefully we'll know some more about that. So by the time you're rough and tumble playing or you're doing relationship plays, little girl, those and then the hierarchy, the, the boy little boys will very quickly, within thirty minutes with a, a group of two or three or four new boys they've never met before, the five or six of them will will establish a pecking order. And it happens really quickly. And then they often they did this study where they got these same boys together like Five years later, after they gotten older, and the same pecking order happened right away. <laughs> Whereas little girls are like, kind of, it's it's just so much more subtle. You don't kind of, there is a like, you know, a pecking order, but it's kind of very much more subtle. But the boys, the boys don't seem to mind it. They know right where they fit in. So that's what happens up to what we call childhood. And remember, 
but from about a year after we're born on, it's called childhood, and the hormones are very steady and very low level. So the estrogen and testosterone in both of male and female children are right about the same until da, 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 the beginnings of the, the testicles and ovaries start to make the hormones of puberty. And we can talk about that if you want to. Next. Yeah, yeah. Let's, so let's stay on in, in childhood. So I'm guessing the difference is, and we, we touched on one of the big themes here is that for little girls, it's all about this connection, right? And for boys, it's about kind of that rough and tumble play hierarchy, you know, kicking the bad guy's ass. And, and, and I'm guessing the difference between those two is really just, it, I mean, it comes from the hormones, right? Estrogen and testosterone are, are the main players there. And so the little girls will have more estrogen, the little boys will have more testosterone, and that will change what they're, how they're driven to play. Is that correct? Yeah, well, that's, that's how their circuits were made while they were in utero, and they've come out with these pro propensities. So sure. Propensities, and that's why they think that it's important to realize that um, your experience, if you ask a bunch of different doctors and psychologists and people that study all this stuff for many years, whether it's more biology or genetics or more the environment, how you're raised and stuff, most of them will say, oh, well, it's 50% genetics and 50% environment. So the, the agreement is it's, it's about 50-50. So our environment shapes a lot of us too. So let's not forget that part. But we're, we're talking about the basic kind of biological wiring that's been noticed. Right. And so I, th if you're a parent, this stuff is so important because if you think about it, you know, I know as a little kid, I was kind of rambunctious in school. And if I'd go home and my teacher was like, Nicholas couldn't sit down today. He was always running around and playing. I mean, that's kind of how we're wired as children, right? And so my parents could have could think like, oh, he's a bad kid. Or if, the, if you understand the underlying biological principles at play, you really, you don't judge as much, right? You can understand what's going on, especially in these young children. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, it's, um, I know I had a boy, so I, I remember finding out I, I was 13 weeks pregnant. I found out I was going to have a boy. And I, went, I, I said, the first thing was like, I kind of got sucker punched. I go like, oh, oh God, what am I going to do with the boy? <laughs> and then actually with my next thought was, Ooh, I don't have to deal with the teen girl years. So, <laughs> you know, whatever I was, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, how parents raise you as the gender that you are it's it's not like they're they're purposely they're 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 re raising a child is a co-created reality. Mm -hmm. The parent is responding to the wiring and the personality and the all all types of things that that are that are who the child is. So remember, it's not just it's not like parents are just imposing something on this like little blob. But you you were like you said, Nicholas, you were rambunctious. You you had your own you had you had your own mind from the get go. So right. Okay. Awesome. So now we're, we kind of understand, you know, what's happening in a little boy and a little girl. Now we're getting into this teen years, pre-puberty, puberty, and, uh, some things start to change and it, kind of dramatically, right? What starts to happen? Oh boy, does it ever. And I think you probably remember that one graph in the male brain where at age nine years old, then between nine and nine and nine and 14, that the graph of testosterone goes like this. And then it goes like straight up. It looks like, it looks like a, it looks like a COVID surge, you know, it looks like a COVID <laughs> yeah, surge. COVID. It's going straight. for. It's the February cinema. and now it's March. Woo, yeah. baby. So that's the, it's going up like times 250. I mean, it's really a big change. And what's happening, of course, is the testicles have gotten the, the, the switch has been flipped in your hypothalamus, the section of the brain that, that turns on puberty, the switch got switched and it's sending messages down to your testicles to make testosterone. And so the testes are starting to respond by about age nine and a half, 10. And by age 13.5 is the, is the average age of wet dream for males. And that is how we identify the start of puberty for males. So that means all the systems, all the systems are go, all the systems are working. Lights are green. Lights are green. You got that. So, um, and the testosterone stuff, and like, I, like I describe in the, in the book, you know, in the male brain, it's like. Or, you know, and, or even on page 39 of the female brain, I did a little section on boys will be boys just to t try and teach the females a little bit about what's kind of going on that, you know, every, every woman that walks by, that's like a pair of breasts, all of a sudden breasts start to speak to you at that stage as a boy. It's like, and you're even your aunt or your, whatever, your sister, you're feeling embarrassed. You're feeling like you just don't quite, I know. And some guys, some young, I mean, when it starts happening first, kind of some guys feel like they're turning into a perv, you know, it, it's, it's a little shocking. It's sort of powerful I and mean, they're shocking. Wouldn't you agree, Nicholas? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a definitely a fixation on, on sexuality and, 
uh, you know, butts and boobs, essentially. Female body parts. Are <laughs> yeah, exactly. at, that, at that age. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I also want to say that that's, that's the stage when you become, that's the same stage that your sexual, your sexual interest really gets, gets, um, get happens. So if you're going to be same sex attracted, then that happens then too. If okay. you're going to be opposite sex attracted, that happens then too. It's just, it's the natural unfolding of how the brain works. And so, but the boys that are going to be interested in girls, they, they do start to be focused on butts and curvy whatever and boobs and just it's uh they you know and i think females need to realize it's not it's just the natural way that the hormones are causing the visual circuits in the male brain to search out like they are scanning the environment for anything with breasts because mother nature made it that your job guys your job is in so as far as mother nature is concerned you're supposed to search out fertile females and then impregnate them to keep the species going. That is your only job on this planet, according to Mother Nature. Yes, yes. So what happens socially with men at, at, in this age? So we already know kind of sexually their interests have changed. What's happening socially, interpersonally um, with, with men in going into their teens? Well, they, I mean, they feel kind of awkward around girls because they kind of not sure that the girls can't read their minds. <laughs> <laughs> They kind of don't know what to do with all that, you know, kind of visual imagery and all that, all that, that, that you know, they're by, they're by, they don't realize yet that biology is just, they don't realize what their biology is doing to them entirely. And they're, they're kind of awkward in trying to, trying to make, trying to do social interaction, et cetera. They're a little awkward at that stage for sure. And girls okay. are, are similar because the girls are, the, what, what happens on the counterpart is the girl's estrogen starts to go sky high too, and starts to go through the cycle and the menstrual cycle for girls average age is 12.1 so we were a couple years before you guys and so you know our brain the fifth fifth grade or sixth grade you look all these girls have breasts and the guys are kind of like they're kind of still sort of clueless they don't know what's going on but right we haven't noticed them yet and you haven't noticed them yet it hasn't happened. Soon. that hasn't happened but 13.5 yeah. you're all of a sudden going to say wow why didn't i see all these before this is <laughs> this is like you know i'm surrounded by breasts and whatever it's like a kind of cool thing but um the uh so the interaction so the girls at that stage what's going on in the, in the female brain is that the, she's trying to attract a male I mean, Mother Nature made so that actually they, they, there's studies that have been done that three or four days before ovulation, females start to um, dress a little sexier. They start to sway their hips a little bit more. So they emphasize mm -hmm. their hips and they emphasize their butts a little bit more. They wear sexier clothes, maybe more high heels, a little bit more makeup, you know. They start because big puffy lips with the big lipstick are supposed to indicate it's a fertility signal. And they may just wear, you know, more cleavage or something. You know, they're just kind of showing they're showing off the goods, as we say. Because... And this is all subconscious, right? Like they don't even realize they have a drive Ex to do this. No, exactly. Because the studies will show that they, they, they're not even, if, if, if you ask them about them they say no i just felt i just felt like dressing up today you know i just kind of felt like you know doing you know and so um that yeah so it's biology's destiny right so so that happens because um the 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 female's testosterone is also released by the ovary and its highest level is like two or three days before ovulation. Mm -hmm. I said, that's how mother sh nature, she made it so you'd get pregnant. So, you know, you're, the women are looking for it and the guys are always searching for it. They're always looking for an opportunity. So they're always ready when you are those three or four days when females are, are kind of looking for it, they, they, they don't have much trouble getting lucky. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is like a high level overview, but there's so many little things in here that, that can change your life. I mean, for me, I read you know, men at this age want to stay up later and wake up later. And I remember in high school for me and, and even, you know, middle school, like we had to get, you know, school started at seven twenty or whatever. And like, it was hell for me to get out of bed in the morning. And it was, it's biological, right? I had an excuse. It's chronobiology because a, a 15 year old boy needs two hours more sleep than a 10 year old boy. Um, your brain, your brain is, your brain is sprouting and growing all of these sprouts everywhere. And then it's also being pruned. And the time that pruning happens to shape your circuits into the circuits that are going to make you into a man, you know, the pruning of those circuits mm -hmm. happen at night, only when you're asleep. So you really, and the growth hormone comes out at night. So your, you know, all of your muscles and your bones have to, your bone, probably some of you guys remember like that probably some guys like almost grow a foot in a year during this time, their growth hormone is being, it's 
coming out at night and all the growing is happening at night. Remember when your penis got longer and your balls started getting all that kind of stuff that's going on at night, guys. While you're while you're sleeping, your everything is everything's enlarging, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, so so get plenty of rest. Um and one thing for the women here, and this was really good because women can tend to I think at this age be a little erratic in their behavior and and you know it, it comes down to to that cycle and the hormones and and one thing that you said is, you know, for women at this age, it's all about being accepted, right? And connecting. And if they feel like they're getting rejected by their friends or by, by a boy, they just, they're devastated, right? Oh, so it's like this. So if you think about it think about how mother nature wants it to be set up so that the female biology, she is, she's wanting, she becomes an incredible people pleaser. She, if any, you know, you can remember some, you probably remember some girls and any of you have, you know, teenage girls around at about 10 or 11, 12, if any other girl, anybody doesn't like them or says something that's not so nice, whatever, it's not just a little thing. Oh my God. It is like drama, drama, drama. It's like, it's painful. It's like, it's like daggers to their heart. You know, so the not being liked by somebody um, for a teenage girl becomes just really excoriatingly painful. Yes, you're absolutely right. And so the people pleasing and wanting people to like you and becoming a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was a girl, there was this magazine called Seventeen Magazine. We'd look through figuring out, oh, can I look like that? I want to look like, you know, you're trying to figure out how you should look. And I'm sure it's on, everybody's on the gram these days. You know, the, the teenage girls are, you know, are on TikTok. They're wanting to figure out what they're supposed to move, my, how they're supposed to dance, what they're supposed to, you know, you know, all, all of this stuff. They're trying to figure out basically how do in those three or four days before ovulation, they're trying to figure out what their best way to look and be and sway and, you know, fashion and stuff to attract a mate. They're trying to attract the best sperm guys. So, you know, and, and that's a tough spot to live in. Cause it's, it's a high stress, right? If I, if I don't get accepted, I'm, I'm not enough. And so just to, you know, for, rejection, for anybody that's, rejection. that's a parent listening, I, I doubt I have many teen girls listening to my podcast, but for anyone that's a parent listening, it's important for them to recognize those, those drives and those emotions and just to, to observe them and to know that that's their biology and that they can, they can choose to, and you know, to an extent to, to feel and act differently. And Nicholas, uh, you'll laugh because when I was, when the female brain was out and I was around bookstores and stuff, I would have guys come in that you know, guys in their forties and stuff. And they would buy a stack of six books and they'd have me personalize it. Dear Jim, dear, whatever, you know, whatever. And I, it was kind of confusing at first. I thought like, what, what? And they're giving it to their guys. And they were all like guys in a, you know, Indian some princess. And these, these groups that were dads have teenage girls, you know, mm -hmm. and they just couldn't, they were pain. They wanted that chapter too. They wanted the teen girl brain chapter because they wanted to figure out what had happened to their little girl that they were just, they were in pain. So they wanted to know what's going on under the hood. They wanted to lift that hood and understand what's going on under the hood in the brain. Yeah. Well, this is the, the best source I've seen for, for some of that information. So we have, you know, a, a teen boy, teen girl. Now we start to get into the, the mating years, right? We've developed, we've matured early twenties, maybe looking for partners, uh, looking to settle down and there's again, more changes in biology, right? What starts to happen as we come out of puberty? Right. So in both of the books, I made chapter three be the mating, mating and dating stage of life, which I kind of put, it's like, like, you know, the 18 to 28 kind of, you know, that chunk of a decade there, um, where that's mostly what you're doing was on your mind and both, both of the sexes and just how, you know, the, the female is trying to find, um, find a mate that's going to be loyal to her. Loyalty is really, really important to females. Mm -hmm. And it does, it's not, it's not a, it's not a moral thing. I mean, you might think it's, it is moral too, right? It's, a, it's got some morality to it and stuff. There's a moral part, but she needs someone to be loyal to her because the female is basically going to be the pregnancy for a female is like nine months. It's a very long time. And human, human infants are not born like jumping out of the womb and standing up and saying, let's go right. feed me, whatever. They're, they're helpless. They're completely a blob of helplessness. And they, they probably shouldn't even be out of the womb for another year, but female, <laughs> the body can't kind of handle that. So they come out pre really early and the female cannot do that by herself. She needs someone to help protect the nest to help someone, you know, someone needs to be there to support her. So unconsciously, now her hormones are driving her to find a, a really loyal, stable, interested, devoted father. 
um, to be the to be the to be the sperm donor, so to speak, you know. <laughs> and she will when she notices that trait in a man, she'll feel attraction to him, right? She'll feel attraction, and she'll feel like um, you know she'll get she'll. There's a lot of signals. I mean, a lot of women are attracted to bad bo- what we what we what we what we what we ladies tend to call bad boys, and sure. like that. So I don't want to overgeneralize that, but it's kind of the ones that clearly are love them and leave them types that are not loyal. They're the complete opposite of, of what you would want to have, you know, a father helping you protect the nest as a female. So there is that attraction, especially those three or four days before ovulation. There's attraction to like those kinds because whatever, that's just how mother nature made it. Cause you're probably more likely to have sex with one of those. Cause they, whatever you get, you get the picture, right? Yeah. So it's biology is destiny unless you know what it's doing to you. <laughs> yeah. So, Perfect. So, uh, so women are looking for kind of that loyalty, maybe even dare, dare I say some, some, a man with some status or some resources, uh, through we this call it the wallet, a wallet biopsy. A wallet, I love that a wallet biopsy or a bank account, bank account biopsy. <laughs> yeah. And then, so what are, what are men looking for? What are we out looking for? I mean, obviously still boobs and butt, right? But you really want the fertile female. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I think that, I think things have changed, you know, I think that that males also, they really also want um, someone who can be a partner to them Mm -hmm. and help them in their career, in their life, in their aspirations. So they usually, they want some, a woman that's a, a match with them. And they also want a woman to be loyal. They do not want someone, they don't want to choose someone who's going to be off like, you know, on her two or three fertile days a week with the guy down the street. I mean, that is like, no, guys do not want that. They also, they're also really selecting for loyalty. Well, but a big part of it is looks. I mean, for guys in the fertile, this type of mating in the, the 18 to 20, in that chunk, chunk of decade, or even way for all, I think until men are 90 or 100, they're still looking for yeah, it. Until we're done. Listen, men are very visual. They want the attractive parts. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you're blushing Nicholas. Well, yeah, I'm just <laughs> my, yeah, this is a great conversation. I'm, I'm just having thoughts and realizations and, uh, taking some notes here. So loyalty, it's, it's very evolutionarily expensive to raise someone else's child. Right. And so that's probably where that, that comes in. And it's called um, the cuckold effect. Exactly. It has a word. It's called the cuckold effect. It sounds, it sounds like a bad word, but it's actually a technical word in biology. That means that, and there are some, there's some birds that have that. They, they'll, they'll, they'll go lay their eggs in another bird's Cuckoos. nest and the, and right. And they, they'll, so, and of course, in primates, in um, various types of primates, if there's a, been a, an alpha male in the troop that's impregnated a lot of females, and then that alpha male gets kicked out and a new alpha male comes in, he will mm. kill, he'll murder all the infants that are born that next season and then impregnate the female. So it's, it can be very vicious. Now, human guys don't do that, but they, that's why the loyal, that's why they want to be sure. And before genetic testing, remember, they couldn't be sure. So it's a whole, it's a whole evolutionary, it's it's really evolutionarily wired into guys Mm -hmm. is that they want to be sure of the loyalty, fidelity of their mate. So pick a, pick a loyal partner and you don't have to worry about all the offspring, right? (laughs) That's right. Exactly. You want to be, you want to put all your energy and your money and your resources and your love and care into raising one is of your own. So that's one of the things that happens is a problem with stepchildren and step, you know, it's just, it's just biologically, it's, it's very hard. I mean, there's, there's some very loving kind fathers who can raise their own and their stepchildren equally, but that's really rare. I mean, so just. Don't beat yourself up, guys, about that if that's what's going on in your life. Just just accept it that it's a kind of a biological thing. And of course you have you have the freedom of will and choice to overcome that and try to be the best adult person you can for this child that's not yours, that probably you that probably needs you needs you very much or needs yeah. you even maybe more than your own biological children. So you you know, you have you have choices, but I just want I'm just talking about the the, the naturalistic biology. Yeah, perfect. So let's get into, I guess, these the covers of these books. So the telephone cords and the and the duct tape. And the duct tape for me represents fixing it, right? Men are problem solvers. We fix it. We're on a mission. How does that show up in this phase of life? Because I feel like men are they they're starting to get a purpose. They're starting to get their career. They're starting to get a vision for what they want. How is that shaping up in their biology and in their lives? So I put the duct tape on exactly for that because like male, male brains, males when they see a problem, they really want to fix it. And 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 
let's talk about it in the relationship world because a guy sees an if if if, if his woman brings home an emotional problem, something that happened at the office, or she brings home something that happened with her boss or a coworker, and you know, oh, his his first impulse, he wants to fix it. He wants to tell her what to do. Yes, absolutely. Wrong. X. No, guys, do not do that. I even put on my husband's computer a little yellow sticky that says that he's supposed to before he come up with a problem and his whole gut and everything is wanting to protect me and tell me what to do and to fix it he he's so he's still he cannot wait to tell me what to do but there's a little yellow sticky that says he's supposed to say these words to me first before he jumps in he's supposed to say honey i know how you feel and those are magic words even to my ears even though i know it's all it's all like he just reads it because that's not what he's feel honey i know you feel because the other person she wants to know that you've clearly heard her, you've mm -hmm, heard her mm -hmm. emotional distress, you've whatever, and that you're listening to the details of what she has to, to tell you because she doesn't feel that you can jump in and give her any advice unless she's certain that you understand how she feels about it. Because there may be a couple of details about it actually that you haven't heard that are critical to the solution of this thing. That if you just jump in and bulldoze her, she'll go, oh, blood, you don't understand, and she'll mm -hmm. walk out of the room. Guys, that means f that you just failed. That means you just failed. It's a test. <laughs> women are always testing men. I I have a whole theory on this. But but so it's women- It's an opportunity, guys. It's an opportunity to like rise up and, and read that little sticky that says, honey, you just try it, you guys. Try it. The next time she comes with all wound up and upset, just try to, that little stick, honey, just say to her, honey, I know how you feel. Yeah. And she will melt. Likely the, the woman probably doesn't even want you to solve the problem at all. She wants to, to connect over it and feel heard and feel seen and, yes, and let that emotion connection. They, let they, that they emotion work through, right? They do because you if you think about it, anything it's like you really can't go into that office or that situation and fix something. You might go and punch somebody out, but you know, whatever. You're not gonna do that. So truthfully, if you think about the logic of the next several steps, is that she has to solve her own problem. And if she, and she, because she's different than you, she cannot implement it in the way that you would advise her to implement it because she's not you. And you don't also know all the nuance of the relationships at work that she has. You know, there's just pieces that she doesn't even, she can't tell you because she, they're intrinsic. You know, she just knows mm -hmm. them in her nervous system and she can't just transmit that, transplant that into your brain. So guys, it's, it's a little egotistical to always think you know how to fix it better than she does. But that's our that's our nature, right? We're driven to that. We want to do that, and 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 if we do, we're we're speaking a different language because we show love through solving problems. Women show love through you know through connecting and and sharing feelings, and so we'll be on totally different frequencies if we go with our biology in these in this case, right? Yeah, yeah. I think if you just if you just understood what we, what we Nichols, if people if guys and gals just understood the little three minutes we just talked about about this kind of thing, things would go so much better. And eventually, guys, it also goes better in the bedroom if it's going better in this direction too. So yes, there's a big, perfect. There's a big, big reward for you guys. Good, good incentive <laughs> there. So we're we're through this mating and dating. Uh, some guys know, you know, people live that their whole phase of their life like that. But anyway, so let's say we get through mating and dating. We're having kids. Now there's a whole nother set of evolutionary changes happening as we look to raise this child, right? And so what happens once we've procreated or as we're getting ready for that? Well, the daddy brain and the mommy brain are the, also the, the, the similar chapters of chapters five in both of the books because they're, they're, they're a bit different. And the mommy brain is very much wired to like hear every cry, every little thing, and be just like hyper, hyper focused on that helpless infant, which is Mother Nature's way of like keeping that helpless infant alive and keeping our species going. Mm -hmm. The daddy brain is like, you know, really, really also very bonded to the infant and still very bonded to the mother and can sometimes feel left out though because the that dyad between mother and infant is very tight and besides the baby's getting the breast now <laughs> let's be clear guys the baby's the baby's got access and you are out <laughs> so that's a period of like it's, it's just i mean just to be fair to guys i just feel like i feel for them i feel for you guys at that stage because it can feel a little bit like you're being left out or excluded so your job is to kind of support the nest and to keep things running smoothly uh, so that the so that the infant can survive and start to grow up a little bit and not need the breast anymore. Then you can have them back again. <laughs> Eight, 18 years later, right? But, <laughs> yes. but we make we make biological changes in that process as well, right? We you know, people talk about putting on 
men put it on baby weight, sympathy weight, our sleep changes, there, things happen, right? In the, oh, in the male system so as well. Much. So during the woman's pregnancy, it's very typical that men will gain weight along with her. Sometimes as much, maybe they'll gain 10 or 20 pounds along with her while she's gaining weight. And um, um, a certain percentage of men will do that. And, uh, you know, it's basically, you're just, you're also nesting with her. You're nesting with her. And you guys are nesting together and you're maybe you're maybe you're putting on extra fat to try to like you know mother nature may have made it that way too that you do that so that you're you've got enough energy when the baby comes along to um mm -hmm. then go with go without as much food or whatever it is you know you're you're going to be you have to be more active so and another thing just things just pop in my head here uh we go as you know let's say our younger dating years were a little more dopamine driven a little more to get that high once we kind of find someone, we have a good connection, we move into oxytocin, which is that more stable love connection. Uh, and so I'm guessing as, you know, we develop a bond, we have a baby in that time, we're moving more into that phase of kind of that sustainable relationship where it's not as, not the highs of like the new love, but, but a little more deep bonding. Yeah. Cause you know, the high love kind of lasts for six to 18 months, that kind of like dopamine rush type of high and bonding where you're always, you can't be without the other person. You have to be next to them. You always yeah. want to be having sex with them. It's like, if you're on a business trip, you're on the phone with them, having phone sex, whatever it is, you know, just that's, <laughs> a, you know, that whole stage. And then you go into like a more steady, like the word, you know, oxytocin, it's called the love. It's not oxycontin. It's oxytocin. Which one did I say? You said oxytocin. I just, no, I always oh, say okay, that. Okay. I just like, it helps people remember that it's ox that oxytocin. Okay. It's, it's yeah. the bonding and love hormone that we get. Yes. And it's, 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 it's hugely more in the female because she has, est estrogen is one of the main stimulants in the brain to tell the brain to make oxytocin. Mm. But males have a lot of, remember males, males testosterone in your brain, males, the testosterone that goes into your brain gets converted by an enzyme into estrogen. So you really have estrogen in your brain and it's the, the enzyme is called aromatase. It sounds like a coffee bean, but it's not, but you have a lot of aromatase in your brain. So the testosterone going through your guy's brain converts into estrogen. So it hits a lot of those and it helps make oxytocin for you too. Um, when orgasm, there's a lot of oxytocin cells down in the genitals as well, because it's the, um, it's the hormone that causes the uterus to contract during labor to squeeze out the baby. It's also the cells that squeeze out the sperm. So it's the, it's the oxytocin after orgasm is also squeezed out to help do the squeezing thing, but it also has an emotional and biological thing about making you feel closer to that person. And the body is just this is just mind blowing. Like the, the, the people don't stop and go, what is even going on? Like, how does this even work? It's just, it's just mind blowing. It's so cool. And it's so, so neat that you've kind of cracked the code on some of this stuff. And, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm having so much fun on this interview and we're just, you know, just getting into it. So, um, not really, but so, all right, we have a baby, we've made some changes. We have different priorities, right? The hormones are, are kicking in. The mother's on high alert moving through that phase. Now, does it go straight into kind of post having children or was there another phase in there of raising the children? I don't remember. So, so chapter six is an interesting chapter because it's all about the, it's about emotions, emotional, the emotions in the female brain and the, in the female brain book and in the male brain, it's emotions in the male brain. It has to do a lot also with, with, with all kinds of feelings, like for, for men, kind of the pecking order hierarchies thing, along with feelings of anger and aggression. Remember, males and females feel the same amount of anger. They feel the same amount of anger. They report feeling the same amount of anger, but males have a 20 fold more physical aggression response to their anger. So that's the, one of the biggest behavioral differences in psychology that researchers know for lots of years of the behavioral difference between that the hormones make between male and female. So the physical aggression reaction to your anger, you know, it's kind of like when you get angry, you want to punch a wall, mm -hmm. you know, or you don't, you hope you don't punch somebody else, you punch a wall or, you know, or you go out and you drive too fast or you go out, and you, you know, you know, the stuff that guys, guys are just like, they're just, their anger can drive them. Females anger can be going a lot of different directions. You know, she can, she can scream. She can go verbal. She can go verbal. She can go ballistic 
drama verbal very quickly with it. So we, we, we ladies, instead of punching walls, we just like let it rip verbally sometimes. So yeah, I dated that girl. So, so just, yeah, exactly. Just, sorry guys. We're, we're sorry. <laughs> we're apologizing. I'm apologizing for, for all the women. We probably just like all the little verbal barbs we throw at you guys and we're angry, but we're not throwing fists instead, you know? So anyway, that's the, that's, I, I talk about that in, in chapter six in both of the books and kind of what you can do, but how you can use the steering wheel in your life a little bit differently with that. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, and, but, but the, you know, the deep drivers are still there from, you know, when we're born into this phase of life, I mean, solving problems, how the different styles of connection, you know, I mean, I mean, there's variations, but the, the underlying themes kind of stay the same, right? Definitely. Okay. So let's say this, our, our little baby starts to mature, gets out of the nest and now more changes take place. What happens in the, in the dynamic of the parents and kind of on their own. Um, and, and we'll get into that, you know, a little bit more in, in the upgrade as well, but what starts to happen, uh, to, to men and women as you know, they're empty nesters. Well, so, you know, as the kids like launch out of the nest and start to have their own life, first of all, they don't want to hear from you parents. You, we all, we always remember, we always thought our, all of us remember, we didn't, we thought our parents were clueless. <laughs> they, they had no idea how we were living our lives. We had, you know, so remember that that's going on in you're you're watching it in reverse. You're watching that happen with your kids and they don't need you. They don't only need you. They don't want you in their life, whatever. So the empty nest is an interesting place, right? It's a place where all of this intense, uh, love and care and, and hyper vigilance and attention that was going to them is all of a sudden, Ooh, your dance card is all of a sudden got extra spaces on it. So to speak, you know, you've got, you've got some, you've got some time and energy to do other things. And, um, you know, your kid in college does not want you calling them every day. You know, they want mom and dad, they get on with your own lives. So there's that piece of like, being unplugged from that piece of a uh, intense bonding. Mm -hmm. And, um, so women are often also going through the hormonal change. I call in the book. I, I dropped the words perimenopause and menopause because those are fossil words that were made by the, the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry to, you know, basically, um, identify a particular deficit deficit time. So it's kind of like a disease diet. It's a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I'm the upgrade. I'm looking at the whole pie chart of the whole woman, the complete woman, like from, you know, part of the slice of that pie chart is yes, the perimenopause and the menopause, et cetera, but it's not the all of you. So, because part of you is like, you, you now have an empty nest. You have other things to do that your career may be, you may decide at this time that all of this new energy and focus that you have and the hormones you see aren't, aren't this wave, the hormone we're talking about, about this the estrogen going up and you're spending all this time on your appearance and looking flirty and this and trying to attract the best sperm, you know, that's, you've run out of eggs. That's, you're not being driven underneath by all of that stuff. And the end of the PMS, PMDD time where you're, you know, irritable and you want to bite the guy's head off or you're bursting into tears. I mean, that will go, that's gone. You're going to be, things are much more stable. And so you can really put your feet on terra firma and have, have, a chance to regain and claim your authenticity, your true voice. You don't have to be like a people pleaser all the mm -hmm. time. And we'll get into some more of your strategies on that in a moment. But so, I mean, these like emotional swings for us men are, they're so foreign, right? So when, when women go through them, oftentimes we're like, we just don't understand it. But one, one duck, question I wanted duck to ask. And cover, it's duck and cover days, right, Nicholas? Yeah. Duck and cover yeah. Days. <laughs> um, one question I did want to ask is, do men go through a similar cycle, uh, do they get an upgrade? Do they, I mean, do they change their priorities and their focus and their hormones? At, at so yeah, it's a great question because so you see, th women go through the thing, the thing called menopause is where your hormones, you run at a million, um, women are given a million eggs at birth and they keep, they start dying off right away. So by the time your period starts, you are down to 500,000. And by the time you hit 37 to 41, your eggs have run out. So we, we don't make any more, but you guys, your testicles start to make sperm you know, and they, your testicles will continue to make sperm your entire life until mm -hmm. you're in the box, even after you're in the box for a few days, probably, but you know, <laughs> you guys are still making sperm. The testicles continue to make sperm. So it's un totally unlike the eggs. And we, so we go through the menopause. We, our hormones just drop off a cliff. The estrogen that's made by the, by the, uh, ovary, the, the little follicle where the egg is, is hanging out 
is what makes the estrogen and boom that's gone so you're you're out of you're out of estrogen that doesn't happen to males so males at about 30 years old you guys start to lose a, a little bit of your testosterone every every year all the way up and way up into your 90s so it's it's it is a decline it has a word we call it we call it andropause and the word androgen is the mm -hmm. testosterone is the main we could, could call it testopause but it's called andropause it means the decline of the androgens in the male over time as aging happens so whereas maybe you want you could have in your mid 30s you maybe wanted and had whatever you maybe wanted sex um let's say uh, once a day twice a day at that stage by the time you hit your 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, it may be down to um, once a day, three times a week when you hit your 80s, maybe like, you know, between once every couple of weeks. It's, it's hard to imagine how it changes. It will change because your testosterone level is going to be going down. Mm -hmm. But it's not a falling off the cliff like menopause goes, boom, you're like, like door shut, game over, that's it. Okay. So let's talk about... I guess some of these, some of the strategies you've, you've outlined in here to make the transition as smooth as possible to really understand what's going on for women and, and kind of get into the specifics of, of what's in the upgrade and how women can apply that to their lives. Yeah. So I, the reason I wrote the book is I wanted women to realize that actually life's not over at 40, you know, and that, you know, there's all this very cool stuff that's happening and you to take charge of it, to learn new techniques, because basically there can be about 30% of women have a really rough time during the transition years. And that can start like for some women at like about age 40, typically about age 41, 41 to 51 are when the transition years happen. And that's when the, the eggs have started completely running out and the ovaries stopping making estrogen. That can be also times of like heavy bleeding. It can be a lot of sexual difficulty in that stage because you're feeling like a mess all the time and you're not, your, your hormones are, being jerked around some days you have higher estrogen and sometimes mm -hmm. lower because the pituitary is telling that ovary make more make more make more and the ovary is saying hey i'm retired leave me alone you whatever you know so that's this battle that's going on between your pituitary and your ovaries as you go through the transition so those years are really the years that um that women need to be able to have a partnership with their with a physician with a doctor to help them through whatever it's going to be for those years because i'll give you the the one thing about the hot flash right the hot flash is the typical thing we all know about menopause you get women get very hot it would be like sitting in a room nicholas where let's say that the temperature all of a sudden in the room for everybody went up 10 degrees well everybody might feel a little hot right everybody mm -hmm. might sweat or might feel a bit warm whatever okay but for a woman that's in the transition or menopause if the temperature in the room goes up one degree she'll feel hot, start sweating. Nobody else will be hot, you know? So it's got to do with the, the temperature gauge in the female brain is going haywire because and getting what's called a narrower range. The range at which you feel temperature change has gotten down to a tiny, like one degree. And you know, that means you can feel hot almost, I mean, who, who knows when the temperature changes one degree, right? I mean, my, my, my Apple watch doesn't have like the one degree yeah. change on it. I don't know. So, that's Your brain is more sensitive than the Apple Watch. The brain is really more sensitive, and that's the hot flashes and trying to keep cool. That's that's what happens. So it's the narrowing of the temperature range from the little cell, the little cells that do that in the hypothalamus. So that's what that's what will happen. So there's all kinds of techniques, and the, the one thing that women, the bad news is, is it sometimes interrupts, often interrupts sleep. You'll mm -hmm. get hot flash, you'll get to throw off the covers, you'll be, you'll be uncomfortable enough, you'll have to get up, change your pajamas, throw off your pajamas. It's just, you know, it's, it's a constant trying to get comfortable and get cool. So the thing that will take that away and fix that within like literally within a week is when you go on estrogen replacement therapy, boom, that goes away. And let's talk about why sleep is so important. So, so taking, taking estrogen, if you need to, because you're not sleeping is a big deal because remember the brain at, in the daytime, Nicholas is all chattering, chattering, chattering with the neurons are making all kinds of garbage as we're problem solving. We're doing all the stuff we're doing during the day. And at night, your neurons kind of shrink back from each other a little bit and make these little spaces between the neurons where they can go and flush out all the garbage. It just hoses down, it just hoses out, hoses down all the garbage out of your brain while you're sleeping. If you're not sleeping, the garbage is not being hosed out of mm. your brain. And that's what the brain fog, you know, women complain of brain fog, they can't concentrate, whatever. I'm sure you know, Nicholas, if you went for a couple of nights without sleep or, two, you know, 
you know, even one night without sleep, you you feel like crap the next day. You don't, I mean, you may have to focus on something, but you brain, your brain doesn't want to. And what if you felt like that? What if you were getting shitty sleep three or four nights or four or five nights a week for a couple of years? I mean, this is just not, this is not good for your brain. So it's really good for women to have permission to go to their doctor and ask for the hormones to get them through this. Okay. And, and I know a lot of women, you know, just a lot of people in general, they, they may not want something that's not natural. I mean, I, and I don't really know, is this natural? Are there side effects? What are some things that you would say to someone who's, who's curious about that? <laughs> Menopause isn't natural. It's not natural. It's like, <laughs> cause you know, mother, we were dead. I mean, you know, it, we were not that's, evolved to live past the age of like 35 to 45. And that's just that's a great the, point. The, biologically. We're not. So this is, this is all added years. So this is, we have to make it up as we go along ladies now. I mean, you know, and you guys need to realize it's like, this business, this like business of not taking a hormone because it's natural. These are all, I'm talking about taking all natural hormones. They're natural. They're, they're bioidentical hormones. Mm -hmm. The same thing you have in your body. You're, you're putting back something that you've lost and it, you're not going to probably do it forever, but you're going to do it to get yourself through this phase of like not being able to sleep or feeling like your mood is in the toilet. I have women come and say, I have a great life, but I don't feel any joy. I just feel unhappy. And I don't feel any inter my libido. It's like, I don't want, I don't want that thing near me. Get him away from me, whatever. You know, it's like, it's a very, it's guys can feel very rejected during yes. this time. And it's very sad. I mean, it's just like, it's really like they feel they did something wrong. Cause you know, guys, a guy, a, a woman feels love when a guy wants to talk with her and do pillow talk and have, com you know, communication. And a guy feels love, you know, feels love when he's having sex. And if he's being rejected sexually, he feels like he's not being loved. So this can be a dicey time for a couple. And I just encourage the women to know that they can get their, they, the testosterone and estrogen replaced. Uh, it's very, it's very easy available. And with, you know, within a week, you're going to feel better. So why would you deny yourself the natural, you know, the natural hormones that you can have access to? Love that answer. That's so great. There's, there's so many things going on with the relationship, right? I mean, a, a woman has to feel trusted or she's got to feel like she trusts the man. Like there's connection, um, you know, that just the attraction piece, but also these biological drivers underneath that most people aren't even aware of if they didn't have access to, to information like, like your book. So, um, I'm just, I'm in awe of the complexity of, of this human system and our life cycle and, and, and all the work that you've put together. And, uh, it's been so, so mind bending, eye opening. Uh, one question I have is let's talk about some kind of exceptions, because obviously we have women that tend to be more masculine and men that tend to be more feminine and men that want to become women and women that want to become men. And there's a lot of dynamics going on there. So, so what's happening in some of these cases, um, that are, are let's say non-traditional. So um, let's just let's cut to just one example: the trans trans brain, and what so because that's definitely um, um, and it seems to be like about one in one in three hundred people are probably trans, you know, and that's kind of that's that doesn't mean there's a, that. So if you do the math, it's a million, million and a half in this country. So mm -hmm. I mean, I happen to have gone through the transition with some of my colleagues who went from, he was, a, he was a male surgeon. He's now a female surgeon. And we, I went through all the stages with her as she went through this. And I, so I did a lot of reading. I was going to, I was going to write a book about it, but there's the problem is there's, we haven't done enough scientific research yet. So the science isn't really out there yet to understand, um, to say, to say much about what has, what's different about the brain and the hormones, et cetera. But probably, you know, we talked about how the brain develops in utero. So basically people are born with and have, may have a female identity, but a male body. And that probably happens during fetal life in terms of how some of the hormones that are marinating that body or brain and those genetics are slightly, are slightly different that will make that person end up being a identity, a sexual identity, but with a different body. It could be like with being born with a female body, but having a male identity. And so what happens during the teen years, of course, is if someone's going to be same sex attracted that w or be, be gay at that point, they get attracted to the opposite sex, but trans people are not, they're not gay. They're, I mean, they, they, they may end up being gay, but if someone is born with a male body and a female identity, then they're going to want to be female all of their life. Mm -hmm. And during, when they go through the transition, they're going to be, they're going to be attracted. They're going to be attracted to males. They're going to be attracted often to the opposite sex. That's what's confusing to a lot of people I see. with trans people. They, they go through that. Maybe they go through then the hormone changes and the, and the, you know, become 
female at some point or become male at some point, but they're still attracted. They're still attracted sexually to the same people that they were attracted to during their teen years in that transition. So that can, that's confusing to a lot of other people when they look at it from the outside. If someone has just transitioned to being, my friend just transitioned to being female, but you know, he's always been attracted to females when he went through puberty, he's attracted to females and he's still attracted to females, but now he is a female. So now he's called lesbian right now. He's gay. So that just kind of, it's, it turns the mind into a pretzel until you understand it's very simple. If whoever they were attracted to during their teen years, no matter what the, no matter what the hormones or the, the transition they go to, to become the um, opposite sex or the, the gender that they feel that they are, gen, you know, they, the basically, um, they will still be attracted to the people they were attracted to in their teen years. So Interesting. That's, a, that's the best explanation I can give. And there's not enough, there's, we need more research and we need more science about this. So. Yeah. Um, well, great answer. That clarifies some stuff. But, but one question that came up from that, from what you said is you mentioned identity. And I wonder how you would define that. Does that live in a, a little part of our brain and the, the hormones are doing something different? Is that like a spiritual thing, seed that gets planted and it grows from there? What do you think about no, that? It, so, so no, our, our identity, our, the identity about what, what gender we feel we are, how we feel inside. Do I feel like a female or do I feel like a male? That there's, there's a, there are, there are places in the brain that are there at birth. So it's there at birth. It's not something that, and it can be like anything, like anything else in your brain. It can be encouraged or discouraged mm -hmm. during your, during your growing up years, right? Usually the, a little boy who wants to dress, little boy's and dresses and wants to go to school and dresses that's very discouraged and so that will often be kind of shut down and maybe or maybe not when he gets older when he has his own choices may decide to go in that direction or not so it's 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 the environment and how it is a part of the brain to answer your question yes it's a part of the brain that's already formed at birth and can be either um embellished or kind of shut down by the culture Perfect. Perfect answer. Is there anything else that, that we haven't covered or that can, you know, so much life changing information or anything that could change someone's life that we haven't talked about yet? Listen, I think we've got a big basket of stuff and I keep going back to biology is destiny unless you know what it's doing to you. Perfect. I love that. And if you identify as a human, you must read these books, especially for parents. If you're dating, I mean, there's so much, so much gold in, in there. Um, and, and if I'm, you I'm, have a partner, if you're a guy and you have a partner that's like going into her early forties or whatever, the, you know, I really suggest the upgrade for you as a, as a secret behind the, whatever read, because then, then you'll understand some of what's going on and, and not blame yourself, but be able to be helpful to your partner. Beautiful. It has been an absolute pleasure. I am in awe of, of your work in the human body and, uh, and thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Nicholas.